So my presentation is titled Select Moments in the Violent History of American Medicine. So uh, it's one history is one of my interests. Um, I was a I double majored in college. I was an anthropology major and I focused on medical anthropology and I did bio too. Um, but I what, one of the things I like to think about is um, history and how history and um, essentially oppressive structures infuse our modern day institutions and how we can learn, so how we can think about history and how that influences how our modern day institutions kind of function. Um, so in this talk, I'm gonna focus on the history of American medicine. And uh, we usually like to talk about like individuals, right? We like to talk about bad apples, we like to talk about good apples. And we're less inclined to speak about institutional structures and their histories. So in the same way, in the history of medicine, we like to say there were good doctors and there were bad ones, realizing without realizing that medicine itself as an institution may have a rotten history and a legacy that from its birth has been kind of racist and sexist. And so what I want to briefly highlight in this presentation is some moments of kind of patriarchal and white supremacist violence in the history of medicine and how these moments haunt the practice of medicine today. So this is one of my favorite paintings. It's by Gary, Gary James Marshall called Beauty Examined. And uh, you can see some of his works at the Broad Museum once the coronavirus thing is over. <laughs> <laughs> There's three of his pieces there. Okay. Oh, I like this quote. This is a quote um by bill wiley kellerman that i read recently he's a pastor and he's one of the members of the michigan poor people's campaign um and he says white supremacy is always violent that's true whether it's institutionally embedded as in the present moment in healthcare access and water shutoffs evictions homelessness and essential minimum wage jobs um, without benefits or whether it's signified by nooses flags and assault weapons and i like this because it talk, talk it helped us think about um, white supremacy in two forms, right? There's the obvious form that we can see, um, and that's obviously violent, but there's this insidious form that infuses institutions in our country as well. And it's kind of harder to think about, um, but uh, I think it provides us a nice analytic framework to um, kind of critique our modern day institutions. All right, cool. So an examination of the violence endemic to American medical practice has to acknowledge that the medical profession was entangled in the institution of slavery from its beginning. So from the earliest origins of slavery in North America, whites with medical training served the interests of slave owners rather than enslaved patients. Transatlantic slave traders hired surgeons for the horrific Middle Passage in hopes of preserving their human cargo for maximum profit. And in the slave markets of the Antebellum South, Physicians inspected the bodies of enslaved men, women, and children before signing certificates of soundness for buyers and sellers. Uh, the ability to accurately determine the market value of a black person was one of the key professional competencies required by Southern doctors. Furthermore, American physicians also used their access to slaves to expand their scientific knowledge and build their professional reputations. For example, many of gynecology's pioneering surgical techniques were developed on the bodies of enslaved women or experimented on until they were either cured or died. One surgeon pioneered cesarean sections on enslaved women's bodies through repeated experimentation. And J. Marion Sims, who depicted in this painting here, uh, developed a surgical technique to repair vesicular vaginal fistulas by experimenting on a group of Alabama enslaved women. And this is from a series, uh, I think, Paintings in American Medicine that you can access. Um, anyway, there's a, there's a million more of these paintings. Um, okay. Moreover, black people continue to be disrespected and commodified after death when used as teaching material in the form of cadavers and medical specimens in the dissecting rooms and museums of white medical schools. Uh, theft of bodies from cemeteries started with the inception of formal anatomical instruction in American medical schools. American anatomists have long recognized that bodies were best sought 
of groups whose agreement was less likely to incite wide public protest. And so body snatchers prey most frequently on the dead of impoverished whites and African Americans. Their powerlessness and their marginal social status afford little protection for their dead in the face of persistent shortages of cadavers needed for medical dissections. As a dean of one medical school will put it, the only subjects procured for dissection are the products of are the productions of Africa. And if those characters are the only subjects of dissection, surely no person can, can object. Uh, dissection was also a form of punishment. And some of America's early dissection laws stipulated that certain executed criminals be turned over to doctors. In the, into the 20th century, the threat of post-mortem dissection remained a cause for anxiety among African-American communities and inmates at Long houses. So this is a photograph of a cadaver lab in a med school. So this is really interesting. It's from a book called Dissection um, that kind of documents a bunch of photos that um, medical students used to take with their cadavers. It was a thing. It was a genre in photography, essentially, up until the 1950s. So the rise of the genre of dissection photography illustrates how the practice of human dissection was classed and racialized. These photos, which depicted a small group of students posing with the cadaver, proliferated in the early 20th century. Historian John Warner compares these photographs to lynching photographs. Lynching photographs, too, were an established form of group portraiture. And often, both types of photographs, so lynching photographs and these cadaver photographs, were circulated to black communities as instruments of intimidation. And like dissection scene, scenes, some lynching photographs were made into postcards and sent to family or friends by people who had posed with the cadaver. The practice, I'll make another one here. The practices depicted in the dis dissecting room photographs contributed to a legacy of distrust against American medical institutions among many people of color. So yeah, this is telling, right? So a lot of the times they would ins put an inscription on the table. So these are all their names and where they're from, right? And then sometimes they would put an inscription. It's quite telling if they're thinking of the time. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to another chapter in American history. Um, and, uh, and this is on more of reproductive violence. So coerced sterilization played a prominent role in American medical history, and federally funded sterilization programs took place in 32 states throughout the 20th century. California had one of the most robust programs, and the state sterilization law sanctioned over 20,000 non-consensual sterilizations on patients in state-run homes and hospitals. Interestingly, American eugenics laws and practices directly influenced the much larger compulsory sterilization programs of the Nazis. Compulsory sterilization was consistently described as a public health strategy that could breed out undesirable defects from the populace. The law targeted those who were afflicted with, quote, various grades of feeble-mindedness and perversion or marked departures from normal mentality or from diseases of a syphilitic nature. Women who were deemed, quote, promiscuous, nymphomaniacal, or having born a child out of wedlock were also included in the law. Based on records, it appears that the foreign-born African Americans, Mexicans, and the working class were most disproportionately affected. Um, and these surveys continued at every state institution until the 1970s. California's sterilization laws were not challenged until 1979. And there was a famous case of Madrigal versus Cooligan, where 140 predominant Latino women claimed that the women's hospital of LAC, USC, form non-consensual sterilizations. So that's County Hospital. That's where I went to med school. So I know a little bit about it. <laughs> Biased. The <laughs> women claimed that they had been coerced into postpartum tubal ligations after undergoing labor. In some cases, they were coerced into signing consent forms under the threat that welfare benefits would be withdrawn unless they agreed. Some were told that the procedure was reversible and in some cases, no consent was even documented. 
Testimonies in the trial revealed an entrenched system of forced sterilization based on stereotypes of Latina immigrants as hyperbreeders and as, quote, welfare mothers in waiting. The head of Obigayana County was quoted as stating, four minority women in LA, in LA County were having too many babies, that it was a strain on society, that it was good that they would be sterilized. According to one attending, residents were instructed to strong arm patients into accepting two delegations to meet their training quotas. Um, okay, so that's a photo county. That's a poster from the time. Um, people obviously protested this, um, and there was a lot of uh, a lot of activism came out of this. And now there's actually a lot of reform. Wait, this. <laughs> now there's a lot of reforms. So now there's waiting periods after. After you consent to a tubal ligation, there needs to be informed consent, there needs to be signed consent, and there needs to be. Okay. You just need... too far off. Oh, okay. okay. And then there needs to be informed consent and. <laughs> okay. Um, and there's a waiting period, informed consent, and someone needs to, like, there has to be, there has to be no language barrier. No, he's good. He's good. Am I wandering off? Yeah. yeah. Look at it. He's there. No, he doesn't have a sheet. I don't have the sheet. My sheet is right here. What's wrong with you? Get out of the sheet. Okay. Next up. Okay, so now we're doing a more contemporary uh, uh, moment in history. And this is essentially uh, physicians that are complicit in military torture. So since 2001, doctors have played a critical role in the U.S. government-sponsored torture programs in CIA black sites and U.S. military, military detention centers, including Guantanamo Bay and Abu Ghraib, Bagram. The U.S. torture program has not only been designed by physicians and healthcare personnel, but uh, the various torture techniques, such as rectal rehydration and waterboarding, have been perform performed by medical personnel. Uh, physicians play a role in deeming detainees fit for interrogation and for advancement to the next level of interrogation. They participate in the force feeding uh, of hunger strikers. And according to this article here, physicians in the program help translate torture techniques into medical euphemism, sanitizing and legitimizing harmful acts. For example, stimulated drowning becomes waterboarding, exposure to cold temperatures causes hypothermia, causing hypothermia is called temperature manipulation, and sodomy becomes rectal rehydration. And to date, uh, no US professional organizations or licensing boards have taken action against healthcare professionals um, who participate in these, in these programs. Uh, I think that's my last slide. This is one of my favorite books, it's called Dissection. It has, it has some of the photos that I shared. Um, and I think that's about it. It's my talk. Good job, Jimmy. Okay.